Good morning, everybody in TLBC land. Um, so I'm Bobby Noor. Uh, I know some of you guys know who I am. And I'm actually in a different setting today. So um, some of you probably don't know that I picked up and relocated from Colorado back to New England, um, which is pretty exciting. Um, it's kind of a, a spur of the moment move. And so I am back actually with a super cool co-working space um, that I'm working out of. So I am here today with Eileen Nunn. Right? Is that how you say yes, that's okay. right. I want to make sure because I thought I asked you that when I first met you, and I'm pretty sure I know that. That's correct. Um, and so, actually, I'm really excited because I've been trying to get her on for a little bit. We've been trying to coordinate schedules, and I think it was about a month ago that we were on um, and chatting about this particular podcast, which is a fairly new um, event for TLDC. And um, we talked about it at point when we were thinking about launching and I've asked a lot of folks for suggestions on uh, who to bring on but my first guest that I wanted to bring on was Eileen and there's a good reason for it. Um, the whole purpose of this podcast is to really discuss um, what we're doing in the workplace to work at kind of um, diversity across the workplace and I really I, I had said this early on that we wanted to tell the positive stories um, that we wanted to not you know be taken on the industry saying, hey, you know, this is what's not happening, but to talk to people who are jumping in and doing things and just doing them, um, you know, and I think I've told you guys my story before. I mean, I went to work um, essentially as the Army trainer for robotic systems for a long time and um, was the only woman out in the field for a very long time and was never an issue for me. So it's just, it's kind of funny how some people have some really cool experiences that way. But so short story. I met Eileen on an airplane. I think it's been like three years ago, actually. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> on my way to Manchester, New Hampshire, um, I was going for a visit and she started talking to me about what she was doing. And I was like, oh my gosh, she's doing some really amazing things. So the short story, she's she's um, a business major for University of Wyoming, right? Yes, that's right. That's where I thought. Um, who decided to get into um, location of um, utilities, underground and buried utilities. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> some very highly technical equipment and she works in a field that is really truly very much male dominated like i bet you're probably the only woman in the field when you're out there working it off so anyway i'm so excited to have you here i really am like yay i finally can have my so welcome and um you know i'm gonna start it off with kind of what we do as a traditional tlb say we have a really amazing group here. i see some people out here uh kara's on today kara's one of my my favorite people so i'm excited here she's here by the way guys um go ahead and share this out too so we can get some more folks to jump in with us um and we'll be loading up a couple of questions but we always start with what we call the origin story which is kind of like about you so i will let you take it away Okay, well, and just before I get started, I'm looking up because my camera's down here, but you're up here. So if it looks like I'm looking up and off to the camera, I apologize. We all get it. Trust me, we're like, oh, why is she looking right. at me? <laughs> Eye contact, like, I do have that with you. It's so important for me. But yeah, so my origin story, I guess, how far back do we want to go? <laughs> you go back as far as you want to go. It goes back okay. as far as so, that's for you, too. <laughs> I'll get started. Um, so as far as origin story goes, as a little girl, we grew up ranching and farming. And I'll try and pull it together in a nutshell. But I have one older sister and then both of my parents. And my dad, what's kind of crazy and flipped our family sort of upside down, he got injured on the job. And so he ended up not being able to work and so my mom took in that breadwinner role and yeah and so what's so interesting my mom always told us girls growing up she's like Eileen you know make sure you get a degree before you get married like whatever you do don't drop out and just get married her advice to us was get a degree because if something happens you're not going to be in the situation that I am in. Like you'll have means to make a living for the family if needed. And that was really important advice. So my sister and I. Exciting for us and for my parents too, because they wanted to see us succeed in that. But it was interesting because that meant that my growing up mostly was with my dad. So 
he would be home. We would go fishing sometimes and, you know, almost fly fishing like <laughs> weekly in the summers. And he really instilled in me a love for dinosaurs and geology and outdoorsy things and science. I was really inquisitive. That's one thing that he always pushed so much when we were together was to be observant. You know, what color is that? What do you see over there? What do you think about this? And so that curiosity really helped me later in life. But as a young girl then, super into science and totally wanted to be an archaeologist or a marine biologist, something like that. And anyway, as I got older, that kind of shifted, it kind of changed. And so for a while, I never would have been able to picture myself doing what I do today. <laughs> I mean, I never in a million years could have pictured that. And um, I'll just take you through a little bit of it. So because it's kind of neat, I've come sort of full circle. So as a middle schooler, as most of you know, middle school is an awkward, weird, strange time of life. <laughs> it really is. It's, it's, it really is. <laughs> it's and, when you're a new girl. It's hard. When you're a girl, it's tough. And I had a best friend that moved away, and I was lonely and bummed. And, and you know, that time in my life, I definitely more so started to – started to pursue you know approval from others and finding my self-worth in that approval and that attention and you know what society would say that i should be interested in or look like you name it and so uh, it's neat that after all this time now i find myself doing something i totally love is totally right in line with what i loved as a little girl and so the origins, anyway, for me personally, it's kind of come full circle for what I get to do now. I love it. It's pretty cool. Yeah, that's cool. And you know, I'm in geology as well. Um, and living in Colorado, and so I grew up in northern Colorado, so you're southern Wyoming, right? Yeah. There's like the Pawnee Buttes, Pawnee Grasslands area, which mm -hmm. I spent a lot of time out with my dad hunting, you know, looking for arrowheads, you know. Like, yeah study rock fishing i mean i guess maybe maybe it was kind of an unusual way to grow up but i kind of grew up in the same way and i remember probably my favorite class in college of like of all time was one of the geology classes i took that really yeah. on colorado geology mm -hmm. um, and so you know my husband i think he thinks i'm a little odd but you know we spend our time in national parks going to view rocks you know a lot of rocks a lot of really cool rocks. <laughs> yeah and, um, you know i don't know if that if that kind of growing up maybe made me think differently about what i could do um mm -hmm. you know that's a differentiator you know they always say you know nature versus nurture if that is truly a differentiator i think in, in how we see ourselves in the workplace then you know maybe we should be writing a book on how to raise, raise girls you know so that you yeah. and fish and i don't know maybe that's it you know it's, it's just totally get away from the gender stereotypes so mm -hmm. super cool well tell us a little bit about what you're doing right now i just i'm like totally enamored by what you're doing <laughs> yeah i'd love to share that so what I do now, uh, new locating, it started off as a private utility locating business. And we can talk about how the idea and all that even came up um, a little bit later. But what we do now is kind of branched out from that. So I got into using ground penetrating radar, GPR, because it can find non-metallic utilities as well. And so it's become really, really valuable as another tool to help clear a site and make sure everyone's safe before they break ground. And because we use GPR, I've started to be able to get into, you know, looking at tunnels beneath the surface or geological layers and uh, void detection. And there's also some other interesting applications <clears throat> like structural integrity and looking at rebar and concrete and slab thickness, you name it. It's gotten really, really interesting. And there's a lot of ways to apply it that I haven't personally done, like archaeological investigation, hoping to get into that. That'd be cool. <laughs> um, also forensic. I was and, to forensic science. That's another area I know that you, you can do yes. there. 
Oh. And it'd be neat. Um, but yeah, so for right now, lots of utility work still. And then we're branching into the structural integrity of bridges and roads. Uh, but most of the work that we do is with engineers and contractors, specifically uh, refineries, which can be a crazy dangerous location. There's so much in the ground, no one knows where it is. Um, and then lots of fuel stations um, and different properties across the state. So Interesting. That is super. So like, what kinds of things are you finding? I mean, I'm, I'm sure you're finding this surprising. But what are you finding? Like when you go out to a job, what does your day look like? Okay, so the day really looks like uh, what my goal is. First and foremost, on a standard utility locate, I want to make sure all the electrical lines are located because if a line gets hit, someone drills through or digs through a line, there's that risk of electrocution, um, which is yeah, very risky. Also, I want to find all the gas lines or, you know, there's fuel product lines that go from an underground fuel storage tank to the dispensers at a gas station. And so finding those is really important to make sure that none of that is leaking into the ground when it gets damaged or something. And so, yeah, electrical, gas, water, sewer, communications lines, any utility infrastructure in the ground. Okay. Okay. And usually the reason that I'm doing this is so that they can, for the environmental engineers, they want to take soil and water samples. And so they drill in and they make sure that there's no contamination or they try and map the contamination so that they can clean it up and remediate it. Okay. Uh, and then also, yeah, for expansion, uh, all kinds of reasons. <laughs> So is your view a static view? Is it a live view? Is it a video? Oh, yeah. And that's a good question. So I use multiple types of equipment. First, I'll use a standard pipe and cable locator, which is an electromagnetic tool. And what that does, I can direct connect to an electrical line, for example, and I'm going to energize that electrical line with a frequency of, say, 32.8. Then I'll take my receiver wand and that receiver wand will beep and pick up that frequency or the source of the frequency in the ground. So that's the first way that I'll sweep a site is by marking utilities out with electromagnetics. Okay. And then after that, I'll take the ground penetrating radar over and that is a live feed on my screen. As I push it, it kind of looks like a lawnmower, funny mm -hmm. looking. Um, but I'll be pushing that across the site. It's using a pulsed radio wave. And as that radio wave is passing through the subsurface, the uh, two-way time travel of reflections as they hit things underground is measured. And then also the strength of those reflections is measured and it creates an output on my screen that's live. So wow. it's pretty fun. That's cool. And you can probably record it, I assume. Yes, so I can take screenshots and save in images and I can do multiple line scan scans and create a grid and then that grid can be processed and overlaid in Google Earth, which is very cool. Three-dimensional? Well, um, actually, yes. So the, the initial one is just a, a 2D surface and you slice through the depth, but you can create a 3D rotatable cube of your subsurface, which is very cool. Very cool, wow. <laughs> yeah. So a lot of the folks that are on this cast are, um, I'd have to say we're kind of like geeks when it comes to like virtual reality training and, and imaging and things like that. We actually had um, a video Friday that we ran for a very long time that really focused on different types of uh, uh, modalities and then we have some some people here who are also virtual reality specialists and so you know vr in training is a you know certainly an emergency emerging technology vr ar you know xr which is you know essentially kind of a replicated uh, reality that people can train in so we, we're all kind of geeky and find that to be pretty cool <laughs> so i i gotta i gotta understand now from business major to doing this how, how did this happen <laughs> yeah that's the best you question. Know how you learned it too so <laughs> okay and that is really the best question so i got a bachelor's in business management i graduated 
I didn't really know what I was going to do with that. I figured, hey, this is better than, you know, doing general studies or something, and I can probably apply it in some way. What's funny is there was a part of me that had thought that, you know, I wouldn't be smart enough to be an engineer or you name it. It's funny that that happened that way. But I um, anyway figured business management was applicable in so many areas. So I graduate. I work for a bank for a little while and I'm like, oh, I don't know this. The finance industry don't think this is for me. And I'm in this transition period. Meanwhile, my husband, he works as an environmental engineer. And there was, we've been doing, I've been doing this now about four and a half years. So we were newlyweds. I mean, maybe we'd been married a year and a half or something. And he'd be coming home from work and he's telling me his, about his day and his projects. And, oh, it's so frustrating. There's all these unmarked utilities. It's really dangerous. We keep com coming across you know, gas lines and you name it and have to bring people in from Colorado. It's so expensive to get a private utility locate done. And, and he's telling me about this over a four month period and I'm listening I'm sympathizing like, oh man, yeah, that sucks, huh? And <laughs> it's so funny because there one day he decides to call me from work and he'd been saying someone should start this business whoever does it you know they're going to be real successful and and he calls me one day and he's like Eile you know what he's like I've been thinking and I'm thinking okay we need to talk like what are, what are what is this about what are we talking about here and he goes he's like I've been thinking and you you should start this utility locating business you should get certified and trained like you can totally do it and we'll hire you we just really need the service and no one's doing this and he said it over the phone i remember the phone call I'm, i was just thinking you know what okay i mean why not right why not i'm needing to transition out of banking sure let's give this a try but i told him me and my business mind i said okay eric i want you to pitch it to me so when you get home from work we'll talk about it and i'm going to let you do your spiel i'm going to take notes but i want to know like what are the numbers why do you think this is going to be super successful who's the target market like what does this look like and, <laughs> yes i put my business hat on i was all excited but i wanted to be you know <laughs> professional about this and yeah I remember him coming home he goes through the whole spiel I'm writing notes down I'm asking him hard questions and I could not think of a reason not to it was a great idea and that that's how the whole idea came about and so shortly thereafter I went ahead and I found a utility locator certification course at Casper College which is where we are in Wyoming and so I took that. It was a five day, all day, every day, hands on type course. And I went into that. I'm taking notes because I have no technical background, no construction field work type background. So I'm thinking I got to overcompensate, like absorb as much as I can. And you know what? Praise God, I absorbed it really, really well, and I really liked it. And that was the key. I was so interested in the work. And from there, got the equipment, got to practicing with the ground penetrating radar. At the time, there was no certification available for GPR. And so I went to manufacturer headquarters for training on GPR. And that's where I met Toddy on the airplane. That was my first manufacturer training. Yeah. I was really, right? was it yep, yep. Okay. Nashua, exactly. And I was, Oh, I was so excited to get training on that equipment because it was intimidating to me at first. And I had bought books and I was studying books and just trial and error, uh, learning on my own. And then eventually they did get a certification set up through the same university that certified me as a utility locator. So I went to that and built, built on that knowledge, which was really good. And anyway, that's how that all got started. One one kind of funny part of the story when we were initially starting the business and I say we because my husband he's an owner as well but he works as an engineer so um, anyway when when we started this business 
about four to five months in, in planning all of this and getting trained and mapping out how much equipment's going to cost and everything, I see there's this advertisement for a startup challenge, a business challenge in Casper. And I, I was looking at it and thinking like, oh, how funny, you know, I've already been thinking about doing this uh, business. And I was talking to my sister about it on the phone. We're really close and she's amazing. And I was telling her, I was like, oh, I don't know if I should really do this or not. And she's like, oh my gosh, Eileen, why not? Like, just go for it, do it. Um, <laughs> so I went ahead and I got into it. And I had told them, you know, I've already been thinking of starting a business. Their whole goal is to take someone at the idea stage and work them through. And I'd already had a portion of that done. Um, so I told them I wasn't sure if I should or not. They were like, oh, do it. Just do it. And that's kind of been the moral of the story this whole time is <laughs> just showing up and doing it. And so, so I jumped in on that startup challenge and ended up being chosen as one of three winners or qualifiers at the end and we split an amount of grant money and that kicked off the funding for the business and we got free office space for the next year and all sorts of business counseling services. So it's interesting the timing of everything. So much of it, I could not have planned it. I really could never have planned it. All I could do is show up and yeah, make that choice. And really yeah. that's how it started. Well, and, and so I think when I met you, I was probably, I was on the board for Peak Startup at, the, at that point because we were mm -hmm. doing similar things. We were ruling out um, our startup challenges and we had pitch night um, uh -huh. we were doing. So I remember thinking to myself, like I was hoping that there would be something like that as well in your, in your area. Um, I'm actually working in a co-working center in Massachusetts right now, which I don't know if they have anything going like that, but mm -hmm. that would be my next step because that is, I think, part of what really spurs people on is to be able to prep their story, um, to be able to make that pitch and to be able to see how, how people react to it. I mean, there's a whole lot that goes into that. There's the most viable product. There's, you know, all kinds of things that, you know, are really more business terms in terms of, of getting that startup mentality going but it's pretty mm -hmm. cool that's part of your story i mean I, I, it, it really is and, and i'm hoping like my traders in this group also heard you talk about there not being a certification out there because yeah. this is what we do you know the majority of us out here have created like certifications for products um you know and, and typically they're set up for like resellers you know resellers will be the ones that will go and say well i want to be certified so i want to become a certified reseller but oftentimes the user wants to be certified on the product and be able to say okay you know i've, I've been granted this body of knowledge and you know and a competency in the learning with this particular product and that's a really important thing for all of us to have and like you don't realize how much these folks are probably going yeah you know we all we know all about building certs and how come there wasn't a cert out there <laughs> oh right i mean and it's crazy there were a, there was one i found it was incredibly expensive and it didn't seem complete and so Man, when Staking University finally rolled theirs out, I was so excited because I'd been, and you know, in some ways I maybe got more out of that certification than others that hadn't been trial and error trying to figure it out on their own. I had so many answers to questions that I had had and I was so excited about it. But it's interesting, there still is no set standard that says that you have to be certified as a utility locator or as a gpr professional but there are certifications available and so it's like a best practices kind of thing uh very interesting so yeah something to think about that is interesting especially if you're doing work with the states you know because typically you know, state fund contracts will last a certain level for uh, Wow, that, that's crazy. I'm, I'm excited, though, to hear about it. I mean, and, and you, you don't realize you're doing some groundbreaking things. Uh -huh. <laughs> I know. I, really, I did it. And like we talked about earlier, never having felt like the odd woman out. Maybe it's because I'm the only one in Wyoming that does what I do. I don't know. Wow. <laughs> There's not a lot to compare me to out here, which is probably a benefit for me. And that's why you're here. Um, and, and I'm curious, so like, how long did it take you to really get this moving forward? 
Okay, so you, you get the cert, you get the equipment. The business contacts I find are always the hardest thing. Um, yeah. You know, getting in. It, was it easier because your spouse knows folks in the industry? Is it easier because, I mean, Wyoming has tons of oil and gas work. Obviously, and there's a lot going on. Is or was it hard? Was it, what was it like? You know, so we've I incorporated and filed the papers for the business September 2015. My first project that I ever did was in May of 2016. So that that time period, whatever that is, I think maybe, I don't know, five months, uh, a few months, seven months, something like that. During that time period, uh, I had just, because of my husband being in the industry, he knew of different engineering firms that I could call and I could interview and do some market research. So I did cold calls, so many, just saying, hey, you know, what are your needs in the industry? Uh, what are problems you've run into? If someone started a business like this, would it be beneficial for you? And really getting their feedback through that whole process and so yeah in less than a year we had the business up and running uh cold calling is never easy oh my word because <laughs> trying to get through to that person that you actually are hoping to speak with and then trying to convey value over the phone to someone who's really busy already and probably doesn't want to talk to you gets mm -hmm. tricky but I had a number of really kind and generous people with engineering firms and contractors in the state that were willing to set up meetings with me. And so, yeah, once I got up and running, um, after that, really the biggest thing for me was trade shows and, you know, face to face mm -hmm. for me and for Wyoming specifically any kind of face-to-face -face interaction is going to be better usually than the other marketing techniques and methods and you know right. it's word of mouth spreads wyoming's like a super small town <laughs> so i mean it, I, have friends, it, I have friends in casper so trust me okay so um well and it's interesting because it kind of bucks tradition but it also reinforces the fact that you know at least every business is a people business you know really yeah. and it's about developing that people skill as well so are there any professional organizations for locating um you know there is um nolka is one professional organization for utility locators uh that's only one I'm aware of right now in the US. And so um, outside of that, I know there is someone trying to get up and running a specific GPR professional society, which I think would be very cool. Uh, but yeah, NOLCA is the only one I know of right now. And they do have um, their own standards that they've created in regards to training and everything. Um, but it's kind of separate from any sort of ASTM type standard. Okay. Yeah. So have you met any other women in your industry? I I have met other women that are locating utilities. Okay. So for the public one call system, typically USIC is the company. And yeah, I've met two women that are doing that. And I know of one other lady who has her own utility locating business up in Montana. I haven't ever met her, but I, from what I hear, she's doing really well. And yeah, outside of that, I have not met any women doing GPR at the moment. I've seen some on LinkedIn because I, I like to follow people, <laughs> but I haven't met any. <laughs> wow. So hey, there's Morris. I saw hey. Morris on here. Morris connected to me this morning. So welcome. Ooh, um, and, and actually, so, and, and I'll just put the shout out. Um, this group is really focused on training, learning, and development, and that is, you know, TLBC. We're a cast, we're a community. You know, we are a conference. We are um, we're pretty grassroots, but there's an amazing number of folks here. If you decided to find people to help, you know, kind of help you set the standards for what that education base should look like, let me tell you, there's a bunch of people in our group, and I can put you into our Slack channel. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you, you might find some people that would be, you know, really happy to even just sit down and consult with you and say, this is what it would take, you know, for the industry to start to kind of, and I, I don't want to kind of grow up mature 
in, in establishing best practices for certification, you know, mm -hmm. the types of things that will help you win contracts and, and, you know, really legitimize, you know, what you do. I mean, cause it is, you know, it's, it's engineering work. It really is. I mean, it is. And it's very, it's so important that it's done correctly because it's, there's so many risks if something isn't located correctly. And I mean, um, yeah, immediately dangerous to life and health. You're <laughs> that kind of a risk. It's high. And so, yeah, for us, he's with enhanced scanning and we've been kind of back and forth. And I know he's really excited to hopefully get a GPR um, consortium up and running. And I know he'll probably reach out and that'd be great to get some sort of standard in place. Yeah, I mean, cause it's, this is an amazing group of people with amazing experience. I mean, I know, you know, I've spent about 15 years um, developing programs for, you know, for industries and businesses and helping people, you know, map out their governance for their learning management system. I mean, it's kind of whatever it is, I've probably done it. Um, mm -hmm. But it's definitely a great place to start um, to find some folks who, you know, might even be able to sit down for an hour and just have a conversation and kind of give you an idea of what that might look like. Um, yeah, that's, that's super cool. So I want to go back to you being like the only woman out there in the field doing this. What is that like? <laughs> you know, it's really funny because I was thinking about it and and maybe it is the way I was raised. Maybe it's the fact that my husband has been so crazy supportive and through this whole process. But I I've never really had any. I've not had negative interactions. So it's just been amazing. Most of my work is in Wyoming and all of the men that I've worked with in the professional setting as engineers, contractors, you name it, they've all been so excited about what I'm doing and so interested in learning more about it and really, really pleased with the work that we do. Really encouraging. Um, you know, <laughs> I think, I think many times I have an advantage because in a lot of ways, you know, still being a woman on site, they are very willing to help me if I need help with anything. If that's, you know, mobilizing my equipment in a tricky position or, um, you know, you name it, they're so happy to help. And I really reap the benefit of that. And it, it really creates a lot of teamwork on site. Some of the funnier things probably would be dealing with bathroom type situations. <laughs> we talked about that earlier, Tati and I, you know, as a woman on site, <laughs> sometimes the whole restroom break thing gets a little interesting. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, other than that, most of the time, I think the men are surprised to see what I'm doing, but then also very, very excited. And I do have an advantage being the only one really in Wyoming that does what I do. Uh, there is another company that's starting to incorporate GPR into their services, but for the longest time, it's been just me. And I have that advantage in that there's no one else to really to go to and not many people are familiar with it. So uh, they, they kind of take me as the, the expert in that no matter what and so yeah that's been great that that's really cool i am um, i mean and i you know i mentioned to you that i had so much i'm going to change something in my setting real quick here right. oh yeah no worries <laughs> is, is, it, is it okay still yes i can hear you okay just want to make sure so i just i changed something in my setting real quick because i'm getting some feedback um I worked as a trainer for the Army Robotics System, um, by some of the EOD and surveillance robots um, for the Army with iRobot and subject going for years. And I would go out in the field and go up to the test areas and I'd be the only woman out there. And, you know, and it was always kind of an interesting scenario for me, but I too had the same experience. I, I never encountered anything negative and I still have you know a lot of friends from you know my days of doing that you know i'd be out there kind of like you with my hard hat my protective gear my my pp yep. you know um you know because we, we know systems and um you know definitely interesting work and so i love hearing that though that you know you just you decide to go for it and it's just been not a problem which I, you know to me those are the positive stories you know that's so Absolutely. And I know I'm my, I can't speak for other women. My, my story is probably pretty different than a lot of uh, women's stories. But yeah, I mean, Wyoming's been so positive for women, 
you know, in construction, in engineering, and they are, they're always really encouraging more women to get involved. And, and I think the biggest thing, the most important thing isn't seeing as it is some strange occurrence or some out of the ordinary uh, occurrence. It's just completely normal when we're on the job site, normal re reaction, normal teamwork. Um, yeah. And so anyway, I've been super blessed in that. Really thankful for all the great guys that I've gotten to work with and a lot of the great ladies I've gotten to work with also. It's fun to be around other people that have similar interests and, you know, love working outside and love mechanical applications. So it's been cool. That is cool. So what, what would you say to any young woman in college, um, you know, and or even in high school or younger? I mean, what would you, mm -hmm. would you give words of wisdom to them or maybe even speaking to your you know, your 14 year old self, I mean, like, what kinds of things would you have to say? I mean, you've made a success of this. And I'm, I'm just, I'm very proud of you. When I first met you, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is just like an amazing young woman. So, but <laughs> thank you. You know, when I think about it, I have a niece who's 14 years old right now. And so I think about her. What's so funny <laughs> is that she's absolutely amazing. I mean, She's into robotics, she's into coding, she loves science. She's created her own invention for a man-made water cycle that can be used to create clean water for communities. And she is so driven. And I think so much of that comes down to her environment and how she was raised and the positivity around her that she's she's not used to know if from that standpoint. You know, I mean, there's the whole why not thing, I think is kind of. I mean, that's my mantra for today. I love that, by the way. Why not? Yeah. Why not? I mean, and that's that's what I would say. So I'm really proud of her for everything that she's done and pursuing what she loves and um, just full on diving right into it. Super proud of her for that. And I think if I was to speak to her and or my 14 year old self, I would just really, I, I would really want to highlight the fact that so many of the things that we think are important based on what society tells us, not necessarily what men or women tell us, but what society seems to want to tell us. So many of those things, they don't matter one way or the other. And it is so important to just sit back and think about the things you love and the things you enjoy and what, you know, you can say, what is your passion? But, you know, what, what excites you? And if you don't know yet, right, try, try multiple things, figure that out. But I do definitely when, when I have a family and have children, whether they're boys or girls, I so want to be a support and encouraging to them to just go for it and try things and ha have that love of learning and that curiosity in life, because that's going to lead you towards uh, being successful in something that you enjoy for your whole life. So yeah, for young women that are thinking about what to do in college, I would just, I would suggest that they do a little reflection on their, their childhood and their growing up and where their interests are and do a little research, do some job shadowing, maybe lots of engineers and contractors will do that. Okay. And uh, yeah, try different things and don't feel discouraged. I think it's so important to, um, not to internalize the idea of no and make yourself your own worst enemy. So if you can go into something without those preconceived notions and just say, hmm, let's see what happens, and you don't know that maybe society would think otherwise, that's the best way to approach it, in my opinion. So I would just want to be really encouraging in that way. Well, um, and, you know, a failure is okay, too. I mean, yes. that's something that young people just really don't understand. There is a definite drive for perfection um you know and it seems to have gotten worse i mean i watched how my own kids kind of grew up and, and got stressed out with this need for perfection you know my mm -hmm. kids were probably the same thing that i really encourage them to do whatever you want to do and, and they truly are doing it you know my, my daughter does pretty amazing things but I, i'm curious you know like if if you were to take on a group of like young women in stem and i've done this in the past i've actually when i worked with the robotics company um 
you know, what kinds of things would you think might motivate them to really kind of reach out and start looking at, you know, science and technology and engineering as a science? I mean, like what, what motivated you? I mean, was it? Yeah. Hmm. That's a really, really good question. Um, I would say <clears throat> what motivated me in those areas what's funny is as a young girl what motivated me was palling around with my dad and having fun and being interested in it and loving that you know fo fossil hunting and all of that uh, as an older as an older person really um the encouragement of others i don't know i would say i would say turning it into something where you can an experience and something fun. I mean, that's, I don't know if that answers your question very well, but that's what my thought would be is, uh, Some type of thing. yeah, just taking them out and exposing them to experiences so they can actually try it and see hands on if this is something that they might want to pursue or, you know, how is this related, this industry, uh, related to to other things i don't know would you yeah how would you ask that question again <laughs> i have a curiosity on that myself because you know i'm significantly older but i still really i, I find myself really concerned at what i see happening amongst young women and so let me tell you a, a quick fast story my um my son's girlfriend who she's been around in our, our world for like eight years i call her my daughter um she works with a modeling and talent agency and okay. so this gets this constant funnel of, you know, like 75 young women with these beautiful headshots that will, you know, contact her about modeling. And so she literally will start to go through them and, and have very frank discussions with them about what the, you know, the modeling business is like, you know, it's all about looks, it's all about a certain look. Um, and, and many of these young women could be doing other things. And I cannot tell you how many times I've said to Katie, could you give them to me for a day and I'll find somebody to help inspire them to do something different? Cause you know, yeah. I, and I could be jaded about it, but I look at, you know, what, what they're going for as being kind of a jet end because, you know, it's like anything else. you're, you're only get, we're going to get one or two of these folks who are going to be really successful in the modeling industry. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's like, I was like, well, what could I, what can I bring to the table every time she talks to somebody, you know, cause she does, she goes through groups of like 70 of them. Like, what could I be talking to them about that might inspire them to do something else like, mm -hmm. food, um, like make things like get involved in, you know, science and technology concepts. And, you know, it's like, I feel like part of my challenge and, and even potentially addressing that is that, you know, I, first of all, I have an age gap. My daughter tells me that's not an issue, but you know, like I, I actually sometimes work in cybersecurity and, you know, like I have really cool stories to tell about why people should care about, you know, cybersecurity and why that's a really good field to get into. But I was wondering, like, you know, what could I do that would change the mindset of someone who thinks that they can take their looks and make a living on it, you know, because I'm glad you brought that example up because, I mean, that unfortunately is something I definitely went to, you know, when I mentioned that time period in my life, uh, right before high school, middle school, that whole self-conscious time period where you don't have the self-worth, uh, that's exactly what I sought out during that time period was approval from others and attention from others. Uh, and what society would tell me is, you know, the beauty ideals, all of that. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately, it becomes a bit of a brainwashing and you don't see a way out or another answer. Mm -hmm. And I think in inspiring young women, you know, one way to do that might be to ask them, okay, between the ages of one and 11, what was your happiest memory or the coolest thing you ever experienced? What, what sticks out to you in your brain? Whatever that might be. Maybe it was baking with their mom. Maybe it was, um, oh, I don't know, training the dog that they got. Or, I mean, who knows? Maybe they liked to play grocery store. I don't know. <laughs> Whatever it might be. Maybe it's ranching. Maybe it's something different. Maybe it's sewing, who knows, whatever it might be though. I think 
that would be a good way to get them thinking about the fact that the joy that can be brought to them in life that they could have in life okay. can come from another source. Absolutely. Another source. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I know I was a really strong writer as a young person, and I'm still a very strong writer, and I know I've turned that into kind of an augmented piece of my career. Um, you know, I, I definitely still write, I still blog, I still, you know, contribute content and content editing, and I think that's really important. You know, and I think back to other things that I used to love, too, and I was always kind of the science geek. I was the girl out there with the, the rockets, you know, and, <laughs> yeah. rockets and all that good stuff. And I <laughs> I remember working with my dad to, to he would um, do his uh, bow and arrow shooting. And so we would put together, you know, everything for his homemade arrows and stuff. I mean, just mm -hmm. weird stuff like that. Yeah, cool. But, but and, you know, we, we love doing it. And so I was wondering, like, what, how can you inspire somebody? And of course, you know, my daughter, um, Katie, you know, she works in the inner cities. And so I was wondering mm -hmm. how, how often do women in the inner cities get exposed to some of this stuff that might be kind of cool. I mean, the, the ranching or I mean I actually remember as a kid going flying with my neighbors you know my neighbors flew airplanes and I like oh that's so and, cool yeah my brother flew my brother had got a pilot's license when he was really really young and so you know I mean I guess I was just really fortunate that way but you know well, I, that's so intervene you know there's got to be an intervention there yeah and part of it could even just you know field trips right in school we would go on field trips catching bugs or whatever and maybe doing a field day or maybe bringing in an activity where it's something that they're not used to doing even some of those icebreaker type activities and team building activities uh, could be incorporated with stem material and the opportunity for them to be surprised at the mm -hmm. fact that they accomplished some tasks they never thought they could do. I think that's important because many of the times you are so distanced from that, you don't even think you can do it and that's why you never tried. And yeah. so having someone say, oh my goodness, you're smart. Look at what you just did. You can do this. Mm -hmm. That's important. Yeah, it's funny. I think about my, my role with the robotics teams. You know, I never thought twice about taking on the role because I'm so excited to do it. I'm, you know, Frankly, I didn't know what the heck I was doing, but I learned along the way. Yeah. <laughs> so I have another weird question for you. What is the weirdest thing you have ever done in the locating business? Like, what what's the strangest, oh, thing, the biggest surprise you've ever ever had? Or I'm sure you probably come across a lot of strange stuff. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's a number of weird things. Uh, one time I was, oh, I don't know. So concrete scanning i had to get in the bottom of an elevator shaft to check out the concrete slab underneath the elevator shaft so there's all this safety protocol to make sure that the elevator was off and the door stayed open and oh not a fan of that one but i mean i'm also not i'm not a huge fan of large spiders like like big spiders not a fan there were quite a few of those down there so it was that wasn't too exciting um but the i guess the weirdest or funniest work i've done um, there was one time that I was using ground penetrating radar to locate grave sites in a cemetery, which was, for mm -hmm. me, it felt a little bit weird because I'm walking right over the top of the location, the headstones are over here, and um, I mean, for me, that was a little bit strange. <laughs> but, uh, that's how it could definitely be used for forensics. Oh. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> Crime scene. I <laughs> exactly. I, know, I have to think of if there were any other really bizarre, like super weird, funny things that I've found with the GPR. Those, those are the ones that stick out in my head. I mean, so many times with GPR, um, you see all kinds of stuff you don't actually know what it is in the ground. So it's a little tough to say what it might be. But um, yeah, and in the, another really weird one was I was scanning the deep end of a pool. So they emptied it all out. It's like 12 foot deep and we're lowering all my equipment down into this pool and going down this really big ladder. And that was a little bit <laughs> funky trying to get equipment down there. Um, and then up on a roof, even the other day, we were trying to locate electrical on a roof, which was kind of funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it gets, it gets interesting. Drone at all? Do you have anything that is drone based? Um, you know, I don't have anything drone based. Um, hmm. I have seen some interesting applications where they mobilize a GPR on a drone. Hmm. Uh, 
it gets a little tricky because you can get air waves from objects above ground returning to you with that distance between the um, radar antenna and the ground surface. That can get a little tricky. But yeah, the military has used those to find, I believe, the unexploded ordinances mm -hmm. and all kinds of things. So that yeah. is a good location. So what's next for Eileen? Like, what, what do you want to do with your business or personally? I'm just, just, and I, I've seen your LinkedIn videos, by the way, you all should go check out her LinkedIn profile. Um, <laughs> yeah. some cool videos and they've explained some of the things that she's doing and, and I actually love watching them. I think they're awesome. Um, yeah. what, what's next for you? So, you know, hopefully in the next two to three years, uh, my husband and I both would love to start a family. And so we're hoping in the next two to three years that we can have hired more people on at new locating and have that running a little bit more autonomously without having me in the field. Um, so that we can kind of get the family rolling, get that started. And that might look like my husband transitioning into the business or maybe it's someone else and he still works as an engineer. But yeah, we... We also keep bees. We love beekeeping. I really like animals. <laughs> so, yeah, so at some point, it'd be nice to have a property with some land, and <laughs> he really wants goats. So in any case, the big goal is to get new locating to a point where it is smoothly running, still rolling. I definitely want it to keep moving forward. Um, and yeah, giving us the opportunity and me the opportunity to kind of head up starting a family and whatever that looks like. Uh, I'm not entirely sure, but my husband and I have kind of joked back and forth on it because we both like the idea of some sort of homeschool option or a co-op homeschool mm -hmm. option, something like that. And uh, we talked about, you know, maybe I'd be home with them the next couple of years and then we switch and then he's home with them for another two or three years stint. Um, Something like that, we'll see, but it does it does allow me to maintain my skill set professionally too, which is pretty cool. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm lucky to have a husband that also is interested in the homeschooling and everything and interested in kind of sharing roles. So I think that's pretty neat. Yeah, actually I know a lot of homeschoolers um, and I know I've known a lot through the years and some of them are the most curious children you will ever find. <laughs> yeah, probably. I think it's a cool opportunity, you know, to, um, yeah, instill that love of learning and reinforce the idea that, yeah, you can be interested in whatever you want to be interested in and let's make it happen. <laughs> so. A particular group is really all about the curiosity of learning. I think that's what makes us um, really good in the training and learning and development field is because every one of us is, is curious enough to keep, you know, keep asking the why questions. So. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, very cool. Well, I'm excited for you. Do you think you're going to stay just in Wyoming, northern Colorado? Do you have any plans to go bigger than that? Or? You know, um, we'll see. I think both of us do really like Wyoming a lot. And so we probably will stay in the Wyoming, Colorado area. That's what I'm guessing we'll probably do. Um, we also travel a lot and see family and do trips. So we always have loved that, but Wyoming's been a good home base. That's cool. That's really good. Well, thank you so much. So I'm gonna wrap it up here, but thank you. I can't thank you enough for coming to talk to us. And these get recorded. So um, you should be able to share this link back out to some of your social media. And I hope the rest of you will on the chat as well, because um, I just, I love finding great examples of, you know, people doing things that, they're doing them because they can. And, and and actually that's really what this podcast is about is to kind of talk about some of the, the workplace changing and life changing things that people are doing that, you know, really kind of are different from how society, because we talk a lot about society, about what society should be doing. So, mm -hmm. but thank you. I really appreciate you being here. And um, I'm, I'm just so excited. I'm like, I think I'm going to go learn more about GPR technology and consider doing this for myself. I'm sure there must be business on the East Coast as well. Um, oh, yeah. There's some great resources out there. But, I mean, do it. GPR technology is so fascinating. And with your background, I think you would probably come up with some pretty cool applications for it. So, <laughs> yeah, well, I worked with Man Portable Radar in the past um, on the Army application, so I, you know, I have an idea of what it what it entails and what can be done. So, but uh, yeah, definitely, I'm gonna. I'll ask 
um, for Luis to put you in our Slack channel because if you are interested in your industry and starting to kind of figure out how to, you know, legitimize, you know, the best practices with certifications, there's definitely a large group of folks here who can speak to that. So oh, this awesome. is super fun. I've really enjoyed talking to you. This is a blast. So Same um, with you. thank you for having me. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And feel free to, you know, pump out your contact information into our groups too, because uh, we have a cool group on the Slack team. So, but thank you so much. <laughs> And you take care. You too. Bye. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. <laughs> Bye.